in over to you. Right. Um, so uh, one of the things uh, that we were going to do, but I think everybody has seen those uh, little, little, very tiny videos, uh, which I think already is connecting up to um, what you had shown at least one of them pretty much directly. But I think uh, more than, um, of course, if anyone wants to comment on the art projects themselves, that's one uh, a way of thinking about it. But the other thing was just asking for your ideas if something in your own uh, work um, helps you or rather makes you want to think about comparison. Uh, and of course, try and think about uh, what is the potential, if there is any, of these things that we're talking as talking about as universal, meaning the right to breathe, the right uh, particular kind of right to climate justice, etc. Uh, how do we start even thinking about it? Does any of your own work agendas, you know, uh, work with this, or uh, how do you want to think about it? We'll come to the last one later because we don't have to make that the focus, the pandemic, etc. I think that's uh, a little difficult to have very long discussions on. But I certainly would like to think about how any of this comparative work or et cetera is uh, working with your own research agendas. Any kind of response on that? Do we know of anyone working on anything which is comparative or not? Or uh, are you beginning to think of anything like this? Um, I don't work uh, comparatively, but uh, I really need to consider doing that, I think. And I started to draft my, so I'm, I'm working on uh, in a case study in India on uh, the transformation of the electricity system on the example of the national smart grid system, the smart grid mission. And um, I was initially thinking about comparing to, to cities in India, um, the city of Chandigarh and the city of Ludhiana, which are pretty close to another mm -hmm. and have a similar size. And um, then for pragmatic reasons, I uh, abandoned the idea of comparing these and because I thought I want to, I'm approaching these with a, sort of an ethnographic methodology and I want to really focus and go very deep into one case. Mm -hmm. And, um, but at the other hand, I always had, of course, this, this issue that I do want to draw some general or some, some, some more universal insights from this one case. Mm -hmm. And I was very insecure how to, how to bring this up. And um, now that we've also been talking about um, maybe comparability between cases in the so-called global north or global south and without now strengthen this uh, dichotomy, um, I think I should maybe really consider um, also looking at a case in, I am currently based in Vienna, mm -hmm. and maybe have a look how, how, how there are ways of connecting situations. And yes. uh, I think uh, it's, it's been a topic that we've been discussing in nearly uh, yeah, all, the, all the classes throughout, throughout the last days, this, this very uh, context, dependent reading of specific infrastructural situations or situations of transformation. And I was always wondering how to somehow being able to generalize and compare. And uh, I think therefore your input today was, was particularly valuable because it brought this topic up very much. Yeah, so that's my thought on Sure. I'm not doing it right now, but uh, I, I feel that I really need to reconsider um. I, I do want to come in quickly before uh, anyone else. It's, you know, at the same time, um, so, uh, you mentioned the word ethnography, and I think uh, one of the challenges we're going to 
face probably in the few coming months at least is that really being embedded in field work, right? It might be complicated and being able to travel to places, et cetera, might not work out. So um, the one of the things to do is to understand, and I think this is something that you've said it very nicely, which is that uh, even though you're sitting in Vienna and you might be wanting to do your ethnographic work in Vienna, which might actually be possible, but it's also about what you're comparing, right? I mean, we have this sense that uh, if we want to uh, generalize, we can only do that after we have this incredible in-depth knowledge of one place. And the point is also, if you want to do a comparative exercise, it's possible to also, let's say, compare policy documents. You know, I'm just saying, and at the top of my head, it's not, not something I'm asking you to do, but I'm just saying that, you know, let's say you pick up a policy document um, or uh, any kind of thing which is coming out of uh, somewhere, perhaps even uh, the Punjab where you wanted to, uh, you know, do your work, and then you have your own environment in which you're looking. And it's amazing how um, uh, you find the language, the words that are being used are already leading you towards how universal categories are formulated. You know, how something that comes from on high, like the United Nations or something like that, that comes in there uh, or a huge energy uh, agency and gives you the language with which uh, uh, Ludhiana is also trying to interpret the same thing as is Vienna. You know, so it's kind of important to think that uh, uh, we, we don't have to compare exactly the same things. We can bring in different sorts of things. Uh, it's just a thought out there, but I think it's, uh, I think you've, you've really put your finger on, you know, what you might uh, want to think about doing later. And that will be uh, quite interesting to see how it works out, this kind of uh, business of comparison. Uh, but I, I'm wondering if anyone had uh, some Think similar to say, but I think Siddharth was also saying that if you want to, we could uh, think of uh, perhaps looking at the videos or have you already all seen it and we can think about uh, commenting maybe on it. What does the art project make you uh, think? Uh, as the work group that uh, that's supposed to lead the, uh, the conversation today, I think it would be nice if we can see the video because it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. So if everyone can see it, it would be nice. I'll just play it. Here's the first one. It's on this page of the artist, uh, Michael Pinsky. This is the one you want to start with, Yasmin, right? Mm -hmm. Here's the other one. There's about four minutes. Um, so maybe I can just uh, throw in some some short impressions that we had in the group watching this video mm -hmm. and referring to the first question I think um, which we have started discussing before but um, I thought this this example I mean it's it's also some kind of a comparison right between cities but um, and I think uh, it's we can see that it's pretty valuable to to compare these different um, constellations of air pollution that we have but um, I had the thought that actually the, these domes uh, rather compare some, some narratives uh, of, uh, of combustion um, mixtures um, rather than uh, different epistemologies because the, the essence of why the air is polluted is basically that something was burned, I think, right? And um, so... Yeah, I thought it's a, it's a nice example of how or a way of comparing situations to another, but um, it's maybe not a, a very good example for the different epistemologies and um, way, ways of knowing air pollution. Maybe. I don't know if you agree with this. Yes, uh, I, I would love to have someone else uh, maybe come in on um, 
Lucas, right? I'm sorry, I'm not very bad with names. Yeah, great, excellent. So anybody uh, has a thought on what Lucas has just said? Because uh, it's pretty much what I want you guys to get out of this art project, which itself is a huge position of power. Let's not forget that in a certain sense. So, you know, um, the ability to put together this project itself is an epistemic uh, privilege, if you know what I mean. So uh, let's move on from there. Do you think anyone has uh, uh, something, again, first impressions? I mean, of course, um, I, I'm the last person to be able to do any art criticism, but I think it makes you think, uh, uh, what, what do you think is making, what, what, is, what comes to your mind when you think about this? Maybe in connection to what we read, something I I while well, you get your thoughts together, I one thing of course is to respond to what you just said, uh, but also to start thinking about um, again how do you even start comparing something like air, uh, the need to encapsulate it in domes. Uh, where you artificially reproduce exactly what you're saying, the different kinds of compositions. And uh, the way you can do it is also actually go to different levels of combustion in a certain sense. You know, So in a way, it is related to your energy question in terms of you know, uh, uh, what is produced, how is it produced, who consumes it, who, uh, you know, how does it uh, work out, what are your sensitivities to it, and so on. Uh, this is one level of questions. The other thing is to start wondering that uh, why is it that we now want to study air or understand air? We have to put it into these uh, either visible or feelable, experienceable containers. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is because I want you to connect it if you had the chance to read the essay on Beijing by Z. Uh, what you get there is that the kind of point that he makes about compartmentalizing air in a city. So what we are led to with pollution, keep the pandemic aside, just think about the mask and the way we had this incredible proliferation of masks for uh, walking about in the city, in a city with pollution, especially in all these cities, Beijing and uh, Delhi for sure. So it's like thinking that the only air you have now is the air between the mask and your uh, respiratory uh, uh, cavity. So you know it's it's like I think we momentarily lost uh, Yasmin. Anybody else wants to pick up? I had a couple of thoughts that came to mind uh, while I was uh, thinking. Um, ironically, both are uh, linked with um, things to do with India, but located uh, outside, but perhaps that's not uh, entirely coincidental. One is if you look at this page, um, of Patrick Oscarson, he runs a project around air quality monitoring and participatory um, environmental monitoring in India. And uh, another is this lab run by Julian Marshall at uh, the University of Washington, where they've uh, been doing quite interesting things with, with the temporality of uh, exposure to particular kinds of pollution in cities. So they've uh, looked at Bangalore, and you've all been reading about this in, um, in the book you're reviewing. And um, they do things like take quite sophisticated monitoring equipment put it in a backpack and lend that backpack out to somebody for a day so that they see what exposure you get when you're on a motorcycle, what exposure you get when you're in your workplace and in your home environment. And that's an effective way of capturing not only what the condition is for the city, but for um, sort of an individual unit of analysis also. I thought those are quite interesting techniques and there's more, um, more really interesting work happening. They have a, a center for advanced studies um, every year in Oslo and there was one a couple of years ago called Airborne and uh, they did a number of uh, quite innovative uh, cross-disciplinary collaborations with chemists and people from the humanities around uh, around air pollution so I'll pop a link as well but are there are other thoughts in the room. No there's also been a project with um, pigeons and attaching air um, uh, uh, sensors to pigeons and having them report back. Um, 
I just had a quick reflection on the video and the pods um, and on how um, it's kind of a way of getting a snapshot of different lived experiences of air, but then at the same time, potentially getting insight into how you're shaped by your own context and where you've been living by the fact that some people smell more than others, uh, etc. based on, yeah, whether you've been brought up in a polluted air or not. So kind of, yeah, it kind of gives you insight into other spaces, but also into yourself uh, in an interesting way. I actually was going to comment about that, the perception, the different perceptions of people uh, of the smell really tells a lot about uh, how do they feel uh, their surrounding and uh, how do they think about the problem that they are living, which is pretty interesting. That's why I like the video very much, because it highlights this issue uh, really very well. I, th I thought about the same thing as uh, yeah, I still have the static noise, but um, Lucas brought up about how this, these are all, this is still narrative. So the example from Norway, they, uh, a place called Teutra, which is a really rural area. Um, so I, I assume there the air quality is great. You know, it's on the coast, it's a small island. Um, and then that gets represented as sort of Norway's air, uh, whereas if I think, if you went uh, to Donmax Plus, which is the intersection uh, 200 meters away from, from where I'm sitting, um, uh, which was also part of our video, uh, the air quality is very, very different from Teutra. So you have these contextual differences and they create the narrative around that. So, but, uh, no, but I also like the, the art project is quite, quite, quite thought provoking. In Bergen, we have a, a project running locally that uh, that gives people sensors that they build themselves. So they get the equipment and guidance to build these sensors, and that can then monitor different environmental aspects. They don't do air quality yet, but they do humidity and uh, temperature. And and since Bergen is probably Europe's rainiest city, uh, people tend to think quite a lot in terms of moisture and so on. And it's it's interesting what kind of uh, discussions that. Uh, that prompts in terms of reflecting on what what does uh, local forecast mean? Um, is it the weather you're experiencing or is it at a particular weather station? Is it really different? Um, we have seven mountains in the city, so based on where you might live, or where you might work, is your experience of that weather actually quite different even within the same city? Just uh, extending Howard's point about the scale at which we tend to think and uh, generalize. I think we have Yasmin back. Can you hear us now? Yeah, yeah, I can. Finally. Okay, sorry about that. Well, that's too much of a practical example of what we're talking about. Sorry, I missed a bit, I think. What was the discussion on about? We've uh, been talking through the different uh, things that surfaced for us um, mm -hmm. after looking at the pollution parts. And yeah, perhaps others want to say something about it. I was wondering um, if we're talking about, uh, about epistemologies and uh, I've always had problems in really understanding this term. And um, I think it's pretty, yeah, it's just very difficult. And even in the social sciences used in, in different corners very differently. And um, I, I just wanted to uh, see if you would follow my, my idea of an epistemology. Um, and I, as I was thinking about um, air pollution, would you agree that on the one hand, for instance, uh, seeing the problem of air pollution as a, as a problem of industrialization and capitalism 
And on the other hand, um, seeing air pollution as more a problem of traditional practice versus uh, the practices that can be overcome by modern technology and modern engines or whatever. Uh, do you think, would you agree that these are two narrative, uh, two, sorry, two epistemologies? Um, it's I, uh, uh, if you're if you're asking uh, the question uh, in in two. I think I want to put your question in two different sort of um, well uh, parameters. One is to say that uh, who is the person asking the question and who's asking uh, putting out the answer, right? I mean that is one way of looking at epistemology, uh, which is to say that it's not uh, how do you know what you know, why do you know what you know. Right. So let's say we're talking about uh, you're talking about traditional uh, practices of certain kinds, which lead to certain kinds of evolution. And then there is the other side, which is the capitalist, whatever uh, industries, industrial pollution, etc. Uh, when you ask the people on the ground to explain, that is their way of saying that uh, this is the way we perceive air pollution. Right now, when there is someone, let's say a government agency or any other regulatory agency, which is interested in controlling this pollution, right? Where, how are they going to address the problem? Now, in the air itself, it's going to be very hard to distinguish. You can do it very scientifically. You can say that okay, this is coming out of traditional wood burning. This is coming out of diesel fumes. Maybe scientifically, you'll find both of them composing the same air. Let's say that I'm breathing right here where I'm sitting. Right. Now, uh, that would be the scientific epistemology. Now, the point is, uh, and this is where the inequities or the privileges of epistemology uh, comes about, is that whose knowledge will count in addressing the overall problem of air pollution. Right. Uh, and now it will, you can say that, okay, uh, traditional things, uh, let's say in India, we do have, we've had this issue in the past. I'm not very sure. I've not been following it up. But there has been this issue that uh, cremation has been a lot of, uh, is, a, is a big contributor to, uh, because of wood burning, etc., is a big contributor to a certain kind of air pollution. Whereas people will come back to that and say that, look, you're going after something like this. How about closing the industries first? You know, so the thing is, it, we can never, what I'm coming around to is that there can never be a binary in epistemology. That's what we have been very much struggling with. It's more about, again, saying that epistemology is also a composition of how many positions of knowing, how are these positions of knowing hierarchically placed? Is there a question of power in, uh, uh, in not just knowing, but in actually implementing the solution? You know, and in that implementation, so it's in that sense, uh, when you bring in the question of narratives, narratives is more about the description. Right, it's more about the representation. It's more about saying this is what it is. Now the question is: with the minute you bring them in contact with another narrative, it becomes a question of epistemology. You see what I'm trying to suggest? It's like uh, putting two. One narrative is fine as a description. The minute it becomes uh, comes into contact with another one, it becomes a difference in perspective. Right, and then you start wondering about, okay, uh, this is why the big question about urban air, uh, uh, you can say, okay, in the middle of the city, we're going to have a lot of pollution, which is uh, diesel related, car pollution related. You go slightly outside, you're going to have all this kind of plastic burning, etc., etc. Right, so it gets complicated, therefore. And therefore, as I was saying earlier, that both space and time, become very important. And sometimes when you have uh, uh, huge cities like New Delhi, right, it's almost like saying that the air you're going to breathe is going to be changing every 10 kilometers. And it's really almost like that sometimes. So then uh, how do you bring in the question of epistemology here, right? So this is why you need that complex to start understanding that there are competing narratives here. When you say use the word competing narratives, you're actually saying you have competing ways of knowing and ultimately the competing power to solve the problem. You know, I don't know if I'm making sense at all, but uh, that's roughly one of the things. I think I've missed something in the middle. 
I'm not very sure, but um, I think this question uh, is, is a very important question to the comparative exercise, particularly. It's just during the break, we were commenting about the video, the AirPods video, um, mm -hmm. and Katinka was saying, uh, of um, uh, commenting on how the perception of people of smell differed mm -hmm. in, in this uh, experiment. And mm -hmm. I, I was saying I, I agreed with this because this uh, actually made uh, lots of sense about the perception of, of the, the mm -hmm. environment to the people. Um, and it made me wonder more about um, how this affects the solution. So uh, if, I, if I'm in a place and I know that there is a problem in this place, but the residents do not. So what, what comes first? Uh, that, do they have to be on board that there's a problem first mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. we just go ahead and solve the problem regardless of whether they feel it or not? And, and yes. Just uh, a thought that came into my mind and I just want to put it out there. This is this is the absolutely important sort of things, right? I mean, you know, there are places, as you saw, and I think one of the things that I wanted to, uh, you know, make have, have all of us feel is that uh, a, this fellow, uh, the artist, when he was going around, he was trying to say that some people uh, don't even see the difference. Uh, you know, when I, I'm uh, breathing in Delhi, uh, I, I don't know that I'm breathing in so much pollution, but it's the minute I landed, let's say, some other country uh, in the north, I realized, oh my God, this is what pure air is supposed to smell like so you know i i wouldn't even uh, know that i have a problem to solve right but here's the difference even in the example that you brought in uh, a certain kind of health index a certain kind of biography of a community manages to kick in that becomes see one of the things that i wanted to uh, throw in and i don't want i didn't want to throw in a very big uh, uh, concept at the very end but one of the things that happens and particularly with pollution sort of stories is the question of evidence you know so that's where you begin to rely a lot on scientific knowledge but when it comes to experience evidence is like showing that look here i am like you had in the in the mining uh, uh, the region where the video we, we just saw was that how do you start showing that you're suffering one is not knowing the problem at all because you don't even know what bad air you are smelling and breathing every day the other is once you're suffering from it how do you even show and prove that you actually are suffering from uh, a bad air. You know, so it becomes a way of in which scientific knowledge has to come down. So uh, to use Lucas's words, I mean, you need the scientific narrative to start working with the experiential narrative. And then you're together able to even pose the problem and then finally think about a solution. So you see what I'm saying is that there are so many knowledge domains that are required to make this whole thing uh, uh, in a certain sense, uh, the ability to think about it just socially becomes such an issue before you can think about the resolution of the problem, the, you know, uh, make pollution go away. I think that's part of the reason why it's so hard, you know, to even uh, understand. And this is why I think I brought in the example of air because, uh, it's so difficult. We all know what pollution is, but the minute you take it to the level of uh, understanding air, it becomes a far more complicated story. You know? I'm sitting here thinking about the political discourse of air and air quality. And uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned that you said in passing, oh, they, they, they tried to get rid of wood burning. Uh, to mm -hmm. improve the air quality, but is that really what's causing the major problems? Uh, and I thought of examples from from our own context here, where um, you, you know you, you want to um, limit um, car driving on certain days, but then you have these gigantic cruise ships out in the fjord, uh, right, which yeah. are creating all this. So it's a question of sort of okay in this political discourse of trying to where we we need better air who gets blamed mm -hmm. and who gets you know who who yeah. who who's targeted with these measures and we also have measures mm -hmm. on you know to get people just to change their wood burn, old wood burning stoves to newer ones which are mm -hmm. create less 
pollution. Mm -hmm. But uh, is there, yeah, I'm thinking through what's the political structure of, of that, that kind of discourse of blame and responsibility? It, it's, it's, uh, I'm uh, sorry, am I interrupting you? No. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's, that's absolutely the point that I'm making uh, when we're saying that there are competing narratives, is that uh, competition in a certain sense is uh, ultimately a political thing. So it's, it's always going to be about power. So like you're saying, and I think I made a bit of a mention on this uh, in one of my papers where I was trying to suggest, and uh, this is an old paper, but the thing is, at a particular time, political will which sometimes we call a disposition, dispositives or you know the, the way in which a certain kind of pressure is built up politically will affect the way in which one narrative wins out over the other you know so uh, uh, so for instance uh, I, I remember this from my students work is that i believe satellite imagery uh, and this is where the wood burning story came in is that uh, the satellite imagery was showing this very large brown cloud all over Asia, particularly concentrated over India, right? And immediately the thing was, okay, so India produces all this wood burning smoke, you know, and, uh, and therefore we now need to go down that. Now that's a narrative coming from the outside. The internal narrative will say, uh, let's get rid of the cars first. You know, so you know, it's, it's, that's a, it's, it's always the competition of which narrative will win out will depend on the political will of the moment. And I think that kind of uh, adds up to what Siddharth is probably going to talk about in his thing, is that the amount of pressure governments now have with sustainability development goals, you know, that uh, has moved into becoming the indicators that you're talking about. These are the narratives that are going to win out. You know, so that's why in Delhi, uh, are you going to start talking about cars and, you know, our odd even policies, et cetera, et cetera, all that we have that, you know, cars with odd numbers will travel on certain days. We had all of that. And immediately that particular day to ask, tell you the political answer, the fight started that it's not our cars, but it is the crop burning in Punjab. So at the end of the day, the solution is always about, about this uh, epistemic competitions that we know what pollution is because we are want to believe this is we want to believe this evidence you know so at the end of the day i think and i'm going on too much but you know something which is so scientific like air is at the end of the day dealt with so politically because there are scientific solutions we know that right but at the end of the day it is the politics which uh manages to uh you know, and something like air, which you thought thought was, you know, universal. If I can ask, I was thinking, so if one of the potential solutions um, is co-production because of, you know, bringing together different forms of knowledge, both in terms of asking the questions and providing answers and, and solutions, how do we really do that in practice? How do we really bring that into the mainstream? This is a very hard one, but uh, you know, and this is where I have to say that however much I don't want to get into this world of prophecies and predictions, but I think uh, in a very terrible way because the globe had to completely shut down, uh, you did see that things can change. I mean, air quality can change. And uh, I think some of that makes you want to think that, okay, when you say that, uh, how do we make all these knowledges work together? Uh, I think at one level, it is very important to start th rethinking the absolute basics, which is that uh, if you're thinking of a city, after all, here we are discussing about air in the city or the question of uh, bringing a city in a certain sense, they have different agencies in a city to work together. Uh, I'm wondering if it is even possible to say that here it is, the basic need is a certain kind of governmental system of coordination. I don't know how it works, and I'm sorry, I haven't been able to uh, uh, be part of uh, uh, you know most of your uh, lectures, but the thing is, how do we work on a model of uh, every governmental agency working with the other. I'm just putting that out as one sort of practical solution. 
is there any way because one of the things we have in delhi for sure is that the mcd is the municipal corporation is not talking to the transportation people the transportation people are not talking to the electricity grid people so you know just the governmental model of trying to figure out how do you guys keep in touch with each other can we build up a system a flow chart of who will talk to who what kind of an agency do we need to coordinate everything you know is there is there a new form of you know in a, a new kind of governmental uh, 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 way of being that we need to start thinking that cities are not cannot be broken up into different departments what you need mostly is coordination how do we think that up you know how can we get the transport guys to talk to the water guys you know <laughs> because that seems to be i don't know i'm just thinking aloud because uh, uh, that's what you do in disaster that's what disaster preparedness is all about that you coordinate and you can't deal with disaster when there is no coordination and that's the precise thing that we probably want to think about in quarter the normal time because i mean just reflecting back to the university as an institution um mm -hmm. at least from my experience there's a problem of of departments within the university speaking together coordinating mm -hmm. sharing knowledge mm -hmm. and even from my department uh, where i've been working there's a problem of people in the department not knowing what each other's work is about what they do yeah so so it's like how do we then actually bring that into governance the sharing when we can't even do it within the university do it so. this is this is you're absolutely 300% right i mean i mean i'm i'm just waiting for people uh, young people like you getting out there and being more vocal like it because one of the things that is has to happen is we have to change our syllabi and the way we put out our degrees this whole idea that the whole science department and the hard sciences and the physics and the chemist physicists are all sitting in one building and all the social sciences are out there doing different things and english literature is somewhere else nobody is talking to each other and i think one of the points very small tiny little thing that i was trying to do with this is to say that just look at the 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 possibility if you get a classroom of people from everywhere else and it's the toughest thing to do because interdisciplinarity is not easy you know sometimes uh, being an expert of nothing really spoils the whole story but uh, at the same time i think this is the nature of the contemporary you cannot break one category from the other the fact that they're all mixed up together has to and you're 300 or 500% right is that it has to start in the places of our education namely the university you know i mean uh, here we have a hard time for uh, getting the government to listen to any academic or they listen to the wrong academics but uh, you know how do you get the university people to talk to each other you know uh, the, we need you need to understand this uh, that that's but i think we're kind of running out of time uh, we are we are running out of time, unfortunately. Um, so I think we have but, to we have to end it there. Um, and I want you to give a big thanks to Yasmin for this. This was excellent. Thank you. Thank really, you. For really good food for thought and, and good examples and, and and things to think about further for, for us. So uh, so thank you so much. I would like to the students to stick around in the room a little bit. We have we, we'd like to talk a little bit about the course logistics, uh, etc. But uh, but before we do that, let's uh, let's uh, wave uh, to, to Yasmin Thank and you. give a nice send off. I'm very happy that the technology worked as well as it did. We it had that did, small yes. Yeah. But, uh,